Side 1, RC40814. The Big Game by Sandy Schofield. Copyright 1993 by Paramount Pictures. All rights reserved. Read by James DeLotel. This book contains 276 pages on five sides. If you would like to skip over any remaining announcements or introductory material, place your cassette player in fast forward until a beep is heard. Stop at that point to hear the beginning of the book. Library of Congress Annotation Quark, the resident barkeep and shady businessman of Deep Space Nine, sponsors a high-stakes poker game that attracts gamblers from all over the galaxy. The game is only briefly interrupted by murder and by mysterious subspace waves that threaten to rip Deep Space Nine apart. Security Chief Odo and Commander Sisko have their work cut out for them in finding the murderer and saving the station from destruction. A Star Trek Deep Space Nine novel, 1993. From the book jacket. Star Trek Deep Space Nine, number four. Death is in the cards on Deep Space Nine. When Quark holds a poker tournament on Deep Space Nine, someone from almost every sentient race, Klingons, Cardassians, Romulans, Vulcans, Ferengi, shows up for what is sure to be the highest stakes game of all time. But when one player is killed, the stakes get higher than even these big money players had counted on. With the station rocked by subspace waves that threaten its destruction, Commander Sisko and Security Chief Odo must hunt down the killer in time to save the players. A killer who has information that can save those on board Deep Space Nine from the invisible enemy they do not even know they face. A killer who holds all the cards. About the author. Sandy Schofield is the pen name for husband and wife writing team Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Rush. They chose the pseudonym when they realized that their six names would not fit on a book cover. The Big Game is their first joint novel, but certainly not their first publishing credential. Dean has sold over 50 short stories and a novel, Laying the Music to Rest, a finalist for the Bram Stoker Award for Best Horror Novel of the Year, the only SF novel to achieve that distinction. Christine has also sold a number of short stories and eight novels. Four have seen print so far. The White Mists of Power, After Image, written with Kevin J. Anderson, Facade, and Heart Readers. Dean and Christine collaborated on a publishing company, Pulp House Publishing Incorporated. That joint venture has brought them one World Fantasy Award, another nomination, a Hugo nomination, and a house full of books, including numerous copies of the best of Pulp House from St. Martin's Press. Christine has stopped editing for Pulp House and now edits the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Her work there has thrice nominated her for science fiction's prestigious Hugo Award for Best Professional Editor. Dean edits most Pulp House projects. His editing skills have placed Pulp House, a fiction magazine, on the Hugo ballot three times. In 1991, they started to collaborate on fiction. In addition to the big game, they have sold short stories to Ghost Tide and Journeys to the Twilight Zone. Another Sandy Schofield novel will appear in the Aliens series in 1994. To Nina, for all those nights of pizza and trek. Chapter 1 The lights flickered for the sixth time. The turbo lift jolted, stopped for a moment, then kept climbing. Commander Benjamin Sisko breathed a quiet sigh of relief. The last place he wanted to get stuck was the turbo lift, and with the odd problems that had plagued the station for the last hour, getting stuck was a distinct possibility. The flickering lights had him bothered, although not quite enough to give up his lunch with Jake. Sisko and his son rarely had enough time together. They had planned the lunch for days, fasting in the morning so that they could overindulge in all Jake's favorite foods, spaghetti, Norellian twist bread, chilled Ruthvian salad, and chocolate cake a la Jennifer. They had just gotten to the twist bread when the call came in from Ops. Maybe if Sisko was lucky, this emergency would only take a few minutes, and he would be back in time to eat half the cake himself. He would never admit it aloud, but he had a weakness for chocolate. The lift stopped at Ops. Sisko stepped out, glancing briefly, as was his custom, at the Cardassian architecture. 
the almond-shaped portals on the top tier that revealed stars, Bajor, and the docking base, the multi-level operations area, and the prefect's office, now his, straight across from the turbo lift. He had never thought he would feel comfortable here, but during the last few months, Ops had become the deck of his own personal starship. This afternoon, the deck was nearly empty, but he could feel the tension, almost as if it had been etched on the walls. He sighed. He had a hunch the chocolate cake would have to wait. Major Kira Nerys stood behind the operations table, her gaze on the viewing screen. Hands clasped behind her back, feet spread in military precision. She looked all business. Lieutenant Dax sat at the science console, her fingers moving rapidly along its surface. Other than that, Ops was empty. What's so important about a Ferengi ship that I had to leave my lunch with Jake? Sisko asked. He kept his voice low but neutral. No sense being upset about missing time with his son if there was a true emergency. The Ferengi ship seems to be suffering from the same power fluctuations that we are, Dax said. They requested a docking bay nearly two hours ago, but have made no movement in our direction. Power fluctuations, Sisko said. You mean we're having more serious problems than the lights? Kira did not look at him a sign that she probably should have called him earlier but did not want to disturb him. He wouldn't mention the lunch again. The fluctuations go through all of our systems in a random pattern, she said. The computer locator is offline. I have someone searching for O'Brien. The outages aren't serious yet, but I'm afraid they will be. Sisko walked down the steps toward the operations table. First things first. The outages were important, but Kira already had that under control. The Ferengi ship was the big question. Sisko glanced at the main viewer where the Ferengi ship hung motionless against the blackness of space. If he didn't know better, he would have thought that the ship was crippled. Open a channel, he said. Dax moved to do so when the station rocked wildly as if it had been hit by a photon torpedo. Sisko lost his balance and fell against the operations table, banging his arm and sending shooting pains through his shoulder. Dax slid under the science console, and Kira cried out behind him. Alarms went off, their blaring cries of warning sending Sisko back to the day his wife had died. For a moment he lost himself in those flaming corridors, lost himself in the feel of Jennifer's dead body clasped against his breast. He swallowed the memory, hard, refusing to let it overcome him. He glanced around. Smoke filled Ops. The lights went out. Blackness overwhelmed him. The acrid scent of smoke dug into his throat. The backup generators kicked in, but the low-level lights only made the smoke more opaque. The Ferengi ship is breaking up. Lieutenant Dax's calm, intent voice broke through the pandemonium. She clung to the science console as the station rocked again. The Ferengi ship was the least of Sisko's worries. All the screens had jumped to life, reporting problems and outages throughout the station. Warning lights blinked all over the operations table. He pulled himself up to it, trying to loosen the pain in his shoulder, wishing he could see better through the smoke haze. The smell of burnt electrical wiring had him worried. Tractor beam, can you hold the Ferengi ship together? He had to shout over the wail of the alarms. Attempting that, Dax's calm voice replied. Kira had pulled herself to her feet. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw her shadowy shape mount the rickety stairs and hurry to the engineering station. Where the hell was O'Brien? Sparks hissed from loose connections. Sisko crossed to a free console and did a quick run-through of the station's life support systems. A few ships have been knocked off their moorings in docking bays 10 and 12, Kira said. Reports of jammed doors, lights down all over the station. No serious damage to the station and no casualties. The constant rise and fall of the alarms served as counterpoint to the three officers' staccato conversation. The smoke had grown thicker. Sisko held back a cough. Life support is working, he said. The system did not register any sustained hit, no telling what caused the entire station to rattle so. The main lights came back on, flooding the smoke-filled room with brightness. I've got the Ferengi ship, Dax said, if the tractor beam holds. He scrambled up the short steps to the science console. Dax had returned to her chair, her rounded figure and bright eyes a testimony to the fact that she was no longer the old man he remembered, but just as competent, maybe even more so. A 
According to the readouts, the Ferengi ship was the largest Cisco had ever seen. It seemed to have sustained damage at the same time as the station. Kira, Cisco said, shut those alarms down and find out where that smoke is coming from. Yes, sir, she said. Dax glanced up at him, her wide, calm gaze helping him focus. The Ferengi ship, the docking bays, the lights. The tractor beam seems to be holding, she said. I'll bring them into docking bay. Make sure you stay away from 10 and 12, he said, in case she had missed that bit of information. He twisted to see the main viewer. The Ferengi ship at a glance seemed to be all right, but he knew that only the tractor beam held it together. Sisko punched the console, moving his attention away from the station's interior functioning. Nothing anywhere near the station except that Ferengi ship. No ship that could have fired a photon torpedo. No record of a cloaked ship appearing at the moment of the shot. Nothing to show that anything had happened, except the damaged Ferengi ship and those damned alarms. Slowly, Dax eased the ship toward the station. The lights blinked again, but stayed on. Then, without warning, the tractor beam quit. What is going on? Sisko snapped into the smoke-filled air. The ship is breaking up, Dax said. Sisko reached for the board, but Dax's hands flew across it, trying everything he could think of just a moment before he could say it. The board did not respond. The tractor beam was simply gone. Thirty seconds stretched into an eternity. It's no good, Benjamin, Dax said. I've done everything possible to re-establish the beam. The alarms seemed to have grown louder, more insistent, demanding that something be done. The Ferengi ship appeared to bounce in space as if it were a sailing ship in a rough sea. He turned to Kira. She was still at O'Brien's station, a frown marring her delicate face. Get a lock on the crew of that ship and be ready to beam them here. Do it quickly, Dax said. Her voice was very low and cold. The ship won't last much longer. Only three on board, Kira yelled out just as the alarms stopped. Her voice echoed off the walls, demanding and impertinent. It grated on him almost as much as the alarms had. Then get them out of there. Her fingers danced over O'Brien's board. On the main view screen, the Ferengi ship broke up as if it had been hit by a hammer. Sections of the ship flew in all directions. Kira was shaking her head. They must have acted too late. Sisko steeled himself. Then three forms shimmered on the small transporter unit. They were close together, and it took a moment for the shapes to separate into two Ferengi and a bald humanoid alien. The center Ferengi was ancient and huddled over. He had huge ears with hair growing out of the centers, and his wizened face looked as if it were about to melt at any moment. The other Ferengi was younger and had ears the size of Sisko's palm, normal for a Ferengi. The younger Ferengi and the humanoid, an Eupirian servant with pale skin and an overhanging brow, had a firm grasp on the ancient Ferengi who leaned on a staff with a gold-pressed latinum head. The Ferengi's dark, intent eyes looked directly at Sisko, and the Ferengi's mouth turned down into an ugly frown. A shudder of distaste went through Sisko. Zek. Grand Nagus of the Ferengi, the closest the Ferengi had to a ruler. Sisko sucked in a deep lungful of the smoky op's air and stood up straight to greet the guests. What was the Nagus doing here? And why? Nagus, Sisko said, bowing just slightly to show his respect, a respect that he didn't feel. The Nagus typified all the elements of the Ferengi, good and bad. I trust you are well from your ordeal. How dare you attack our ship? The younger Ferengi, Crax, the Nagus' son, let go of Zek and stepped off the platform toward Sisko. We had no weapons, and... We did not attack your ship, Sisko said. He would not get into a fight with the leader of the Ferengi. We had nothing to gain by doing so. He swept his arm around Ops. The smoke had thinned a little. And, as you can see, we suffered from the same problem you did. Really, Zek said. You haven't lost a ship, Commander. A small fortune in gold-pressed latinum was on board. Zek paused to let his words sink in. Do we share a problem? Have you lost a fortune in gold-pressed latinum? Heat rose in Sisko's cheeks. He would have to act quickly on this matter. The Nagus could be lying, 
and he would try to make the Federation responsible for the money. We don't know the extent of damage here yet, Sisko said, but whatever hit your ship hit the station. So you may have lost money, Zek asked as he eased himself down from the platform with the help of the bald humanoid. Sisko didn't let the relief show on his face. As long as the Nagus thought they had the same problem, he would be less likely to blame Starfleet. Have you located the culprit? Sisko glanced over at Dax and she shook her head. We don't know what caused the disturbance yet, Sisko replied, but we hope to have some answers soon. Kira, find O'Brien now. Yes, sir, she said. But before she could even turn back to her panel, the lights again flickered and the entire station lost power and went dark. And the alarm sirens started again.